Welcome to the Painter's Dialectic. I'm your host, Josh Green, a painter and art educator living in New York City. And today we're going to talk about the modern arts psyop. And I will be joined today by Dylan Ahn, a philosopher living in London. Today we'll be discussing this little known CIA psyop involving modern art. During the Cold War, the CIA used modern art as a tool to further its own political agenda. We will be discussing the impact of this program and its implications today. And this episode also ties into the last episode with Dylan about the guild setting a standard of taste. Here is a system of power setting the standard of taste for the entire world. Don't just listen to the podcast, participate in it. Go to our Patreon, The Painter's Dialectic, and subscribe. We have different tiers with behind-the-scenes content of how we develop these ideas. This will help us to continue making this meaningful content. Check out also the Instagram page, The Painter's Dialectic. You can check out my Instagram page, Josh Green Artist. You can go to my website, joshgreenart.com, to learn more about me and the art I make. Or if you'd like to study with me, go to greenatelier.art to sign up for lessons. Dylan, how's it going? Good. How are you? Doing good. Welcome back to the show. Um, I wanted to tell you about one of my favorite moments in art history. It's a it's a pretty wild story, but not as wild as the other ones involving the CIA. Mm -hmm. But I, I really love this moment in modern art, and I think it aligns with what we were talking about in our last episode together about standards of taste and how that's often regulated by a power system and, and economic forces. It's not solely up to artists. So I thought I'd provide some evidence for that, so I, I pulled up, um, it's called a PSYOP. So this is um, kind of like a, a propaganda campaign um, done by the CIA involving modern art. So. Before I talk about specifically that, I thought it would be nice to uh, reference um, something I found on the CIA's website. So you can read all this stuff. Go to the CIA's website and go to the FOIA, that's the Freedom of Information Act, and you can just type in the surf bar whatever random subject you want to see the CIA was involved in from the past uh, 30 years ago. Um, it's, it's a bit terrifying, it's a bit eye-opening to go there, but um, I thought just to kind of frame this, I pulled up an article called The Invisible Third World War. Um, this is, it says on the top that it's declassified in parts, sanitized coffee approved for release. They, this was written, or, so there's this guy, Walter H. Boward, who wrote a, a book called Operation Mind Control. And he was an, an investigator investigating into what the CIA was doing at the time. And because of him, a lot of the information was released to the public about uh, these actions. Um, I'm just going to read a little section of it right now uh, to kind of frame everything. So it says, when the first atomic bomb was detonated at Alamogordo, New Mexico, in 1944, the warriors of the modern world experienced a flash of insight that changed the nature of war forever. The men who built the bomb realized that civilian populations were now unavoidable targets and that conventional war has now become a dangerous trigger which could catalyze an earth-destroying retaliation with nuclear weapons. Such old-fashioned methods of warfare as gunpowder employed by revolutionaries fighting, fighting protracted conflicts were suddenly perceived as potential threats which could ignite the nuclear holocaust. The only safe way to wage war, the warriors realized, was to wage it silently. Invisible Warfare, or IW, as it came to be known, became a necessity. 
By the end of World War II, IW research had begun in earnest and in ensuing decades, modern warriors developed a number of insidious methods of subduing enemy populations without their ever knowing that a war had ever begun. This goes on to tell us how, um, I guess during the, that, that time period, um, how the CIA practiced these tactics on the American population. And I'm not gonna read that now. But the one that's important for art history was a psyop involving modern art. So actually the CIA was very involved in how we perceive and appreciate modern art internationally, not just in America. So you saw that they started investing in propagandistic tactics because nuclear weapons were just too dangerous, right? And they, they, this continued throughout the Cold War. The Soviets were uh, spending, I think it was referenced, 250 million on, on propaganda during that time. And they were using a lot of words that Americans really wanted to use, like freedom, and so those words have been taken. But um, earlier, like the, the, the fascists, uh, the Nazis, and uh, the Soviets were making art to create this propaganda. And the style that art came from, academic painting, the, uh, the, the tradition I studied in, in Italy. And um, so academic painting started in the, the Renaissance up until the 19th century. And it's just realistic, right? And so the mindset, when you look at those paintings, you know, they're very dignified. They have a long history behind them. And you see, like, uh, the Nazis used a lot of Roman architecture to build this kind of legacy, you know, this racial legacy. Um, but the, through the academic method, the, uh, the Soviets um, created a style of painting called um, social realism. And that just showed you know, Aryan looking people working in factories, strong men and women uh, as a community. Everyone's happy to go to work um, for the common good, things like that. Um, Soviet realism was, realism was also very popular in China. So I, I don't know if you've, you saw those or not. Um, growing up in that region, did you ever see any uh, social realist paintings? Yeah, I mean, there's a particularly famous memeable one where it basically, people have often said that it looks like sort of a homosexual couple sort of finding sort of a bond together. So this very strong alpha type Chinese person in sort of cooperation with a, with the traditional um ideal version of what a Soviet should look like. And they, they, have, they have all these like series of posters where they're working together, they're holding hands. And so it's been memed a lot as it looks like a homosexual relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that type of art, um, has gotten the name kitsch, right? It, it plays on emotions. It's not critical in any way. And it's supposed mm -hmm. to inspire those kinds of feelings within a person, right? like uh, this, this patriotism, nationalism, um, whatever, it's targeted for that. America also had a social realist movement. They actually funded um, um, murals to be painted across the country in that style. It features mm -hmm. a lot of like farming communities or, or workers in the city, steel workers. But that ended during this psyop. And a lot of actually the painters we're going to talk about, in particular the abstract expressionists, began as mural painters with government um, money, right? They were paid to go around and paint these murals everywhere. Uh, Philip Guston was a famous one who, who did a lot of murals. And actually many of these people learned mural painting in Mexico. They went to, to study with uh, Rivera, uh, who was a communist, and they had mm -hmm. communist ideals. So it's really funny. Um, the artists who ended up acting out this psyop were actually communist. <laughs> Using their own weapon against. <laughs> right. Um, all right, so what actually happened? So during this time, um, the, the people working in the CAA were from Harvard and Yale. They had grown up in elite families. They had studied humanities and philosophies, and a lot of these families and, and them collected art. So they were very educated in art. And when they saw what was happening in the world where freedom of expression, um, you know, free, 
any type of criticism towards the government and things like this were being um, banned, the Nazis called it degenerate art. And they actually made these artists leave the country, even though some of those modern artists that, that the Nazis rejected were supporting them. Um, so they saw that creativity as a threat. They wanted a unified image of the country. They wanted to control all the art and imagery that people saw. And any type of freedom of expression could be a potential threat to that government. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the people working in the CEA saw this. They saw this happening. And so they, they were worried that this type of um, regime could pop up in America where they suppress creative freedoms. Um, and so actually, I like this PSYOP. You know, I think they did something positive. So what they did is they wanted to help fund these painters. A lot of those Europeans who were um, innovating art fled during the World War to America. And so now New York City is the location where all these artists were innovating at. And they also saw the opportunity to move the center of the art world from Paris to New York City. Now, it just seems crazy, like, imagining how on earth would you pull this off, you know? But um, the CAA started working indirectly with, with MoMA uh, to fund these artists. I think they got someone on the board of MoMA. And they also set up foundations that they could put money through. So there was no direct link to the CIA. And they also reached out to very wealthy individuals who could afford to do things like support art or pay for an exhibition to go to Europe to be kind of the front men, right? So they just went up to these, these rich Elon Musk types of guys and like, America needs you now. We need to get the modern art out and we need your, your face to do it. And they're like, oh, hell yeah, let's do it. I want to be a part of this. <laughs> you know, so they started indirectly of uh, funding these artists, giving them shows. Uh, they started getting grants um, and they started paying for them to exhibit in important cities in Europe. They even, I remember at one point, London asked for that show to come to Paris and they had one of these front men just at the last moment drop thousands of dollars to send the show to London, right? So they, they toured all around Europe and that kind of changed the, uh, the global conscious that all the innovations happening in New York City right now, they're really um, the, the future of the art market. And all those, all those painters became rock stars and they had no idea what was going on the entire time. They had no idea that the CA was behind their success. <laughs> but I still think they would have succeeded and been relevant despite mm -hmm. that. Um, it just certainly, it doesn't hurt to have the CA dumping all the taxpayers' money to, <laughs> to get your art out to the world. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, they, they were able for a time to, um, to change American minds, to, to open the world up to abstract expression. And now abstract paintings aren't revolutionary at all. They're everywhere. You see them in every boring hotel lobby, or like you mm -hmm. said last time, maybe in a, in a bathroom restroom, right? It's just mm -hmm. the most normal, standard thing. It was shocking at the time. That's how well they did at, at promoting modern art. And, you know, it, it's not a stretch to wonder, like, is the CIA still doing things like this? Are they still involved in the art market, in the art museums or major uh, television broadcasts? Is this invisible warfare going on? I'll, I'll just stop talking there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you raise a very good point. So sort of wind back a little bit that notion of the first success of the nuclear bomb, bomb, right? And there was that famous sort of quotation where Oppenheimer sort of gave an interview subsequent to that. And he said that his first thought was he reminded, like he was reminded of the line from the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, right? And this, this suddenly we have this weapon. But what came out of it, as you've noted, is this new type of warfare, right? This new focus, of course, 
psychological warfare and the warfare using media has always existed. Like, even in the Second World War, I've, I've heard stories where they say that they've hired magicians to pretend, right, to build these fake tanks and airplanes <laughs> to fool the Germans <laughs> into thinking, you know, the West and the Allies had a lot more equipment than they actually had. And so media was always there to help with sort of what we would imagine as classical warfare. But this new focus on turning away from things like bullets and weapons and, and guns, knowing that the very high possibility of suddenly all of this being irrelevant, right? In the wake of a nuclear weapon, none of this is relevant. You have this new sort of God, right? Instead of you are now not death, but you are a creator. We get to create all of these worlds and bits of media and art for ourselves and turn it into something uh, that we could use as a weapon. And you mentioned something quite sort of important, which was reflected upon by Plato all the way in his Plato's Republic, is the idea that art and media is dangerous because it has the ability to affect emotions, to influence emotions. And so Plato had a very controversial view where he thought that in his ideal city, in his ideal republic, it would probably be best not to have any sort of art or to have art only to a very limited degree. And that is because in the ideal city, we should be ruled by rationality, by reason and facts and information and that sort of thing. And to have this thing exist that could influence people irrationally would be a very dangerous risk to take. And he didn't think it was worthwhile to do. Obviously, that was met with heavy criticism because if you didn't have art, then you know, what's the point whether you, know, you remove a huge joy out of people's lives? But I wonder, right, if from your point of view, you were the ruler, if you were a philosopher king of an ideal city, or if you were put in charge, if you were the you know, president oh, of the United States for one day, and you looked upon the power of, of media, you know, the news, television, film, and of course you mentioned, right, you asked whether the CIA would still be involved. Now, I'm sure in some degree, but I also think that the focus has now gone digital. Right. So if they were influencing, they would be influencing something that is far more sort of in your face, right? Through our phones, through TikTok, through social media, where it's art, but it's always there. It's always in front of you. We're always scrolling. So, you know, from their point of view, it would obviously be worth investing into. And I think that's definitely happening. Um, and of course, there have been sort of people commentating on the fact that the type of material that we get exposed to on TikTok, for instance, is very different in China as it is in the West. So apparently, uh, the TikTok in China is far more informative, far more educational. They talk about things that are sort of healthier, you know, for mental health, that sort of thing. But in the West, they sort of blast us uh, with the <laughs> algorithm of sort of silly dances and that sort of thing. And so one could interpret that as a, as a type of psychological warfare, not just propaganda in like the, in the sense in after the Second World War, in the Cold War, where they're just selling an ideology. Now they're trying to affect people's values and culture and emotions, right? So again, if you were a philosopher king, what do you do? Like, do you sort of say, okay, no more art? <laughs> or how would you regulate this very, very dangerous weapon? Oh, boy. If I was in charge, jeez. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, most, most people aren't critical thinkers at all. Mm -hmm. uh, most people um, don't know how to check any facts. And they never take the time to do it. Um, they just have faith in maybe a group or faith in a particular person, and they just believe what that person says, right? Or maybe they have several groups that they're a part of and several people they trust, and they kind of synthesize their beliefs by weaving what those people said in and out, right? Mm -hmm. But at no point do they really uh, question it, right? Is, how do you know what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Just that simple question, how do you know that that is true? Um, you know, one way to see if, if, if uh, you're being influenced is, are the people speaking to you, talking to your emotions, or mm -hmm. your reasoning abilities? Mm -hmm. I don't know, when I watch the news, I feel like people are playing on my emotions. They're trying to create some heat, some tension, because, mm -hmm. I mean, they have um, financial reasons 
They have uh, all these reasons to um, to create that heat, right? Mm -hmm. But um, you know, listening to people appealing to your your intellect is extremely boring, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's so even if you watch the History Channel or the Science Channel or something, they're not just telling you facts. They have like all these graphics, explosions, and like even the narrator is just kind of like sing-songing the information, and, and the information isn't even that, that detailed. It's very basic, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how do you get, you know, a, a majority of the population who just have faith-based knowledge and they're not experiencing any of these events that they're hearing about, mm -hmm. right? They're not experiencing anything. How do you, what do you do? So I think as a philosopher king, I would definitely be very careful about who gets to create media. Mm -hmm. And then I think one way you could troll that is like understanding the power system, maybe legally governing the power system that is arranged to create that media and their funding, funding it in a way to uh, make sure, because we can't rely on the goodness of people. We have to make sure that their financial stability is dependent on them being good, right? And then they may act accordingly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really think? good point, right? Because the reason why this topic is so controversial is that it's very easy to invite the wrath of people saying that you're trying to censor art, right? Mm. And so obviously we can't sort of outright ban art because often the road to hell is paved by good intentions. Because how do I know myself whether my values, right, of what is deemed to be good art or good works of literature, good film, comparative to someone I disagree with and what they think is good art. So you can see this a lot happening in America at the moment where the moms of America are banning a lot of books from libraries, right? Sort of mm -hmm. shielding their kids from certain works of literature because they think, you know, for all sorts of reasons, whether it's pornographic, they claim to be pornographic or inciting violence and that sort of thing. But of course, people have often said that if you really want to know what's going on, if you really want to develop critical thinking, the banned list of books is the first place you should go to, right? <laughs> right? Animal Farm, 1984, Fahrenheit, you know, you, that's the place where you should go to. So it's interesting how it's sort of reversed, right? On one hand, people who are trying to regulate books are precisely the people who are trying to appeal to emotions, <laughs> right? And the people who are trying to be rational, their works are the ones that are being sort of censored and banned. Um, you raise a very good point about funding, and that sort of reminded me of sort of when Mr. Rogers, sort of the host of the children's television show, was sort of asked to, uh, I think it was Congress or the, or the Senate or something like that, right? So he was asked to give a testimony to justify the government funding NBC. Um, and he would sort of appealed, interestingly, to the main sort of uh, senator, to the fact that he's very, very concerned about what children are watching on television these days. And there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of slapstick comedy, because it's funny and that stuff sells. But his children's TV show is meant to teach kids how to cope with their emotions, how to sort of deal with issues like anger and bullying and things like that. And in sort of, you can watch sort of the, his speech online, it's like 10 minutes or 20 minutes long. And in just those 10, 20 minutes, he's completely changed the, the senator he was talking to from a very cynical person almost looking down almost jokingly sort of dismissive of this complete idea to just completely baffled and completely won over by this idea of genuinely recognizing that there is something there right what you show people especially in their formative years what sort of media you show them has a huge impact in the sort of country and the sort of society that you end up building so it, while it is true that perhaps we should veer towards the critical and the informative, the emotional also has a place, right? It just depends on what emotions you're playing on. So for kids, as you say, if you go straight for the critical thinking and the self-awareness, it's not going to work. Because <laughs> right? they'll, be, they'll switch off, they'll be bored, and there's a reason why they veer to things like slapstick, you know, Tom and Jerry chasing each other. There's a reason why they like this sort of because it's stimulating. But if we can create something that is equally stimulating, but also is sort of underlain by sort of critical thinking and self-awareness, like he 
you know, he did an episode on death, and this sort of the first camera shot was of this fish tank with a fish upturned over. Like nowadays, like that would be unshowable. Like that sort of, <laughs> that's children's television. But he trusted in the kids enough to show them that material to make them understand that actually this is something that is okay to talk about and okay to feel upset about these certain things. So I mentioned before, like in our personal conversation, how Plato, despite his insistence that art shouldn't have a place in the ideal city, given how dangerous it is in its power to manipulate emotion. And yet he uses the very same artistic techniques to sell his own <laughs> ideas, right? He talks about the ideal city, which is a very poetic way of describing, he uses literature, he uses, you know, symbols, metaphors, imagery. When he talks about, you know, the ideal city of Atlantis, he resorts to almost poetic mythology and that. So he uses artistic elements, although he doesn't draw, he doesn't play music. Uh, and even if he did, we wouldn't know because none of that would have been recorded. But at least even from his written works, we can see that he's putting art to use, despite the fact that, you know, how dangerous art is. So to sort of link back to last time, how do we sort of go about distinguishing the sort of art that is clearly being used to appeal to people's worser emotions, like trying to get them to just follow orders, do whatever, you know, we tell you to just consume and that sort of thing, right? as opposed to the sort of art that stimulates emotion, but also asks them to think, right? So the sort of art that you're, I assuming, I'm assuming you're trying to do, right? Yeah, I mean, a propaganda is like a, a dirty word. No mm. one likes that word. But um, propaganda is, is essential mm. because a large, you know, people in general are not rational. People in general are emotional. And even science says that we do not make our decisions uh, with the thinking part of our brain. We make it with the most primitive part of our brain, right? Um, so if you have a giant population like America, I think propaganda is necessary. It's just the intentions behind it, right? Um, if you can inspire people emotionally to critical thought, to think for themselves, right? Um, like maybe these, the, the, the shows I was referencing on the Science Channel may inspire people to learn about science, may inspire people to, to pick up a book or, or, or continue learning, right? Um, so I, I agree with that. I think we should have art. I think art is good. Um, but, I mean, I make art that, that is ambiguous, not that it's vague, but that it can mean many different things, right? And all those things are right. And I do that on purpose, right? So, so that, because my art is for someone, right? I'm not, I'm not just painting for myself alone in a room. I'm mainly doing that, but I, 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 do want, <laughs> I do want to engage an audience, right? Um, so I know by having those different avenues that they might go on, the viewer takes a creative role in the artwork. Mm -hmm. And so my favorite movies and things like that are open-ended, where you have to interpret, they engage your critical thought by being ambiguous. It's not so literal what the message is. Now, once again, um, you know, not, you know, not everyone is able to critically reflect, right? Not everyone received an education. Um, there's different IQ levels. Uh, you know, most people are, are sense, sensing thinking. So they, uh, they deal with really tangible things that they can do with their body. But when it comes to abstract thought, that's uh, very difficult for them, you know? So... I think, I think a lot of it lies in the hands of the creator. We got to make sure that these creators have good intentions. It's, it's an impossible job. Like how, how could you do any of this? Like, <laughs> turns out the solution, right? Is to have good people, <laughs> right? If you have good creators, then they will make art that is, you know, trying to inform rather than manipulate, right? Even if they have the best intentions. 
I think it's much better if they have some qualities, right, similar to to the standard of taste that we spoke about last time, right? Rather than the critique of art, maybe we should have a standard of taste, but the the type of person Mm -hmm. that creates art should be a person that is self-reflective, that is critical and aware of what they're doing, that they're trying to genuinely be thoughtful and mindful of the sort of work that, and they're not just thinking of, oh, someone's told me to do this for a certain amount of money and I should just do it without ever questioning it. At least if they can't question what they put out, they can question the making process for themselves, right? And so Mm -hmm. the idea that you mentioned a long ago, right? The best, of course, is you have someone who can help themselves and help other people, right? But if you can't do that, if you're generally, you know, the CIA shows up at your door with a pistol in hand, <laughs> right? At least you can help yourself, right? You can put yourself yeah. through a, a critical and uh, reflective process. Yeah. To sort of go back on the idea of art being sort of this new power, right? Of, being used in a new way. Obviously, it's been used before, but it's been used in a new way now. Brings me to think that what happens in one day, right? The, the, the CIA or the powers that they no longer need humans to create the sort of art that they want to create. Right? <laughs> so a lot of it is like algorithmic. And of course, now you've got DALI 2.0, you've got all these AI. And one day, they don't need to commission artists anymore, right? At least not human artists to make this sort of stuff. They can just tell, they can just prompt right a, a computer mm-hmm. it's like okay make this <laughs> and then they create all of this you know yeah i i you know i was interested in in ai art when it first came out like i think gan gan image generators were created maybe like six or seven years ago mm. i started working with them in my mfa and now that dolly's out i'm just done with it like <laughs> so i mean the population can be swayed yeah. to like anything very mm-hmm. easily, right? They could they could do that today, if they wanted to. Just overall, the, the we want everyone to like AI art. They'll figure out a way to do that. Um, and then you have complete control of the making, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, I met I met a guy who wrote the algorithm, the first algorithm to uh, generate music. Mm-hmm. And all the video game companies bought him up, and now all the video game music is generated. And they even have an algorithm that can do it live to match what's happening. Um, you know, there's the fashion models, uh, there's AIs that can generate them now, right? So you don't need human models. Uh, there's the code generators now, you don't need a coder. Um, I use, I use um, you know, the famous chat GBT. I use that mm-hmm. to generate um, a lot of text for my website. All my copywriting mm-hmm. was done with, with OpenAI. Actually, some of the intros on this podcast were written by <laughs> Open by AI. It's extremely useful. I'm not going to stop using it. Mm-hmm. It's so cheap too. And and I had hired a copywriter, but as soon as Chat DBT came out, I'm like, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> but it saves money too. Right? It saves money. It, it, yeah. That it's able to um, to produce pages of content in an instant. Mm. So like, yeah. I mean, we already knew this was going to happen, but. I don't, I don't know. Like this world's so crazy. I don't know what what's in store for art. But mm-hmm. you know, we saw NFTs rise and go. Right? Mm-hmm. We thought that that was gonna like really shake up the art world. It did for about a year here in New York mm-hmm. City. Every everyone was trying to do it, jump on the gold rush of the NFT. Mm-hmm. And now it's just like finance bros doing it, and and, and no one cares anymore. Right. Um. <laughs> I mean, that's true. I think we've reached sort of a good conclusion here is that we see that art in itself is just a tool, right? And so even Mm. if you completely remove the human out of it, right, you can create what you want. And, you know, during the wars, the two world wars, you know, people drew propaganda art. After, you know, in the Cold War, there's the very similar things happening. Now we have AI. But at the end of the day, it seems that what we're trying to grasp at is not necessarily the product like the tool that we're using, but the process of how we create and how we perceive that tool. And so it's perfectly fine if all art ends up being created by AI, if we as audience members, or as you say, good audience, if we're critically reflective of the sort of art that AI creates, we make meaning out of something that 
didn't have any intention of making any of it with any meaning whatsoever. Right? But as long as we as audience members are able to think deeply and be mindful and aware of that, it seems that we're still gaining something from it. And from an artist's point of view, right, even if we observe that if people, let's say everybody now is sort of obsessed, they are, nobody wants to buy art from sort of human artists anymore, right? There's still something within the creation process for yourself. I'm sure, you know, you teach, not all of your students will end up selling their work of art, or maybe they don't even have plans of having that work of art being seen by anyone else other than themselves. And yet they come to you and they think that there is something inherently valuable just learning the creative process of this self-examination, this self-expression. Um, so maybe that's where sort of the art, the power and the value of art lies rather than in its tool to manipulate emotion, right? Which, it's, which it has been mainly <laughs> even used for, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, art, art, and many other things, you know, philosophy, um, can make you critical, um, mm. and can make you creative. They can because when you do um, certain types of art and philosophy in particular, it causes you to individuate, mm. right? To have your own thoughts. You know, like I was saying, that most people synthesize just from their faith-based uh, group or, or person, their ideas of how they see the world, you could possibly create your own. Mm-hmm. You could possibly create your own um, ideas, your own thoughts and feelings about the world and about life uh, because you are able to have that, that medium, that art medium to think through. Or just reading philosophy is, is very challenging for the mind and you learn how to be critical. Um, to take it back to the, the creator, you know, I do, I have this fear, not just my students, I have this fear, like, you know, um, what if, what if I do, like, really kick off, and my paintings do have influence, mm-hmm. and what if, what if people do believe the things, even this podcast right now, like, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm inf- trying to influence people to be critical, like, what if they actually do believe me, did mm-hmm. I do my utmost uh, to kind of think it out, um, you know, the ideas that I'm promoting, um, could this negatively affect someone, uh, the things that I'm saying? Um, and then also, you know, is you, you're also not responsible because you make mm-hmm. a thing and then it can be used in any way imaginable once it enters the world, right? Yeah. So it's not an easy, it's not an easy answer what's yeah. right or wrong to do. <laughs> Reminds me of that Bertrand Russell sort of line where he says like one of the greatest tragedies in the world is that, you know, the, the intelligent are full of doubts. And the sort of the stupid are full of certainty. Right? So often you see this inverse correlation of people who aren't very critical of themselves or self-reflective often want to be the messiah of the world, right? They want to be influencers. And yet we have people who sort of are critical and self-reflective, worried about the potential power that they may or may not have. And so there's that old adage where maybe people who shouldn't be in power are the ones who should be. Right? Who, I mean, people who don't want to be in power should be the ones uh, in power. And sort of that, that reminds me of um, Monty Python and the life of Brian, where some guy called Brian gets mistaken as Jesus, as the Messiah, and everybody just chases him around, wanting him to give them like words of wisdom, believing him to be you know, the savior. And his mother just going, he's not the Messiah, he's a very naughty boy, <laughs> right? And so Brian is just spends his entire life going about, you know, trying to convince everyone that he's not. And they take that as a sign that he is, because he's so humble, <laughs> right? And he, he says these very, very common sense things, and they take them to be pearls of wisdom. And of course, in the end, we know as it goes, that can be misinterpreted, used, um without his knowledge and without his consent and without, you know, any influence from him at all to fulfill whatever purposes. You know, people start religions in the name of someone else, right? And of course, that also means inevitably people will be harmed as a result of that influence. And so, you know, for the case of Brian, he was crucified in the end because if he's going to take the place of the Messiah, then it doesn't matter whether he's genuinely a Messiah or not, he poses a threat. Right. And so he ends up getting crucified and his, you know, fellow 
Crucifi sort of tell him to sing that famous song to look on the bright side of life. <laughs> well, that sort of nailed that cross. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're, you're right. So, but that seems to be inevitable that if we're put in any position of influence, even if we're not talking about fame and sort of large amounts of influence, just being a normal, ordinary individual has influence mm-hmm. on the people we know, our friends, our loved ones, and people we meet in life. And we don't know if that influence ends up being a good one or a bad one. That's right. That's right. So everyone listening, you do influence people. The way you act, the things you say, the art you make has influence. People believe what you say. And maybe people even mimic you without you knowing. Um, Have you been critical of your intentions for your actions? are Are they up to par? And another thing, you know, like, really critical people, they have a history of getting killed. Um, (laughs) Socrates, Jesus, uh, Martin Luther King. Abraham Lincoln, John Gandhi, Gandhi, John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. (laughs) They they end up dead a lot. Um, So, you know, if you're going to be critical, just... <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a well. danger in in, in being crit- critical, especially yeah. when your the criticism becomes vocal, right? When you're trying mm-hmm. to actively change something, and yet like this, it's a very hard impulse to deny because if you are critically thinking and you're self reflective, you also recognize sort of an aspect you have an almost have a duty and obligation to others. You recognize mm-hmm. that this life and this world is not necessarily about the individual, the the one person, but about other people as well. And so there is a inclination to try and influence others. Mm -hmm. And that usually puts a target, you know, on your back. So if a majority of people are group think based, (laughs) are faith based thinkers, Mm -hmm. and someone critical appears who's criticizing Mm -hmm. their group think, that becomes a threat not only to their group, but to their self-identity. Yeah. That's why your people react so emotionally and often violently towards any type of criticism. Mm-hmm. And um, I think one thing an art education does is that's your whole experience. Is from the day you enter the door of an art school to the day you leave, you, and I'm sure it's the same in philosophy, probably way worse, mm-hmm. is you are being thoroughly criticized. So you learn how to... Um, how to survive criticism without your ego collapsing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you strengthen your, your self-image to the point where you can take criticism and adapt or mm-hmm. just reflect on it and go, I don't agree with that, mm-hmm. right? But um, it seems like a majority of people, uh, their ego is threatened and they lash mm-hmm. out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you're definitely right. I think a lot more debate as possible, a lot more critical thinking as possible if the environment is right for it, right? If you've all agreed to be sort of to do philosophy, that's sort of a, a subtle agreement that you're there to accept and to give criticism, right? Because that's how learning is done. That's how, you know, so, you know critical thinking, awareness of anything you're doing, that's the only way that's going to happen because we quite often can't trust ourselves to provide all the criticism because we are, you know, we tend to be biased <laughs> for our own work. And so no it way. helps to have... Right? I'm not so biased. It, <laughs> <laughs> so it helps to have someone else to sort of look over the things you're doing and to question what you're doing, to be that sort of inner voice of conscience. Um, but of course, everything is, has to be taken with a pinch of salt because that... Criticism mm-hmm. can in, in itself be misguided as well, right? So it's not yes. always the case that just because they're your teacher or your professor that they yes. have the right point of view and they're definitely guiding you the right way, right? You know, um, there's a lot of complainers, right? Mm. And uh, we choose our friends to kind of help self-soothe us and to reflect back the, the beliefs we hold about ourselves, right? I'm a good person. I, I'm doing the right thing, whatever. We, we get people around us to reflect back. And people who don't, oh, there's terrible people, right? Mm. You know, uh, how many of uh, people listening, how many of your friends actually critically reflect on you? Do they mm. offer a new perspective when you complain? Um, and do they stay your friend after that? 
that's, that's very, very true. I think the essence of criticism, and I guess the essence of, of art as a tool, I think what we've realized is this notion of increasing your awareness. It seems to be unclear, uncertain, what, how, that there is no rules as to whether art is good, inherently good or bad as a tool, right? Whether the influence of emotions is good or bad, whether any criticism is inherently good or bad. It depends on mm-hmm. what the criticism is and who's giving it to you, what the intention is and how you take it. Mm-hmm. But it does all have a similarity, which is that it offers you something new. Mm-hmm. Right? It offers you a perspective and it opens you up to a point of view that you might not have been able to have if not have sort of engaged with art or critical engagement. And that seems to be a good thing, right? Even on the surface, it might feel that someone's trying to, you know, is a, is a common phrase nowadays, that your friends are trying to pretend to help you or pretend to criticize, but they're actually just gaslighting you, right? <laughs> trying to get you to believe something they believe in. Yeah, gaslighting is the other way around. Mm-hmm. I'm sure all of us have been in some relationship where we just felt like we were going insane. Like, what is happening? I, I know this doesn't correlate to what's actually real, right? So mm-hmm. it's tough. I mean, you need to be highly critical in this world to make it through. But it seems like, in general, for thousands of years of history and mm-hmm. philosophy and art, that develop, becoming an individual and being critical is a good thing. That is last to the test of time. So it's, it's safe to say that that's, that is one of those few good things that we know is, is probably actually good. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't hurt, right? To be more aware, to be more critical. Otherwise, we'd be sort of being gaslit at an international scale, right? At a CIA level scale. <laughs> yeah, and, and as someone who works in the art world, um, indirection is everywhere. There are a few businessmen artists out there, which I would never work for, who have all their work made with invisible hands, and then they take credit for it. And then, yeah, the critics who aren't actually critical, you know, they're there as hype men, pretty much, mm-hmm. but they're called art critics. And yeah, it's it's all a show. It's all a show, and it's. Everything's a show, really. <laughs> yeah, and you know, in even in the case of the guilds or the government, there's always going to be sort of faces and hands, right? As you say, and I sort of I remember seeing this film uh, by Wong Kar Wai, Hong Kong director, called The Grandmaster, which is talking about um, the martial arts world, but more in terms of sociopolitics and our place in it. And one particular individual within that film talks about this idea, right? That within a school, within a, any organizational structure, there are people who are outward facing that are supposed to represent something, the general ideology and the idea. But to execute it, you must have people who are actually doers, the active part. And the face can't be stained by any problems, right? It, it can't be criticized in any way, otherwise it just fails in its purpose. It must be sort of spick and span. Because if any stain or any blood reaches the face, it means the destruction of a guild, right? It means the destruction of a clan, a school, and sometimes even a country, right? So the the dissolution of the Soviet Union. If it starts to break apart, then very quickly people realize, oh, hang on a second, it's, you know, it's breakable. But you have to give this illusion um, through fixing a lot of things. And usually the best way to do that is through art. Because art is sort of this ideal (laughs) picture, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you break the ideas behind the art, the art in itself seems to be as a concept, sort of above it all. I guess if I had to imagine the worst case scenario of a propagandistic society, it might be one where there's a constant screen in your face just streaming information (laughs) to you and you're actually physically addicted, like the imagery is actually designed by neuroscientists Mm. to interact with your dopaminergic system, Mm. making you physically addicted to watching that screen your entire day. And it takes away all your free time so you never have any seconds of your time to actually critically reflect on your life. 
I think that might be the worst case scenario if that ever happens. <laughs> right. As a, future, as a hypothetical. As a hypothetical if that ever happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, can is... you imagine anything worse than that? Could it get yeah. worse? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something that is so sort of like the whole point of critical reflection and self-awareness is to pay attention to what you pay attention to. Imagine something that can just take your attention all day. Gives you yeah. no time to pay attention to what you pay attention to. Right. Like, what a horrifying thought. <laughs> and how could someone even pull that off? Just imagine like the, yeah. the giant psyop to pull something off like that. That would take decades, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. You'd have to invest a lot of money into like technology and to like, you know, into devi portable devices that you can carry around yourself that holds all of the entertainment of the world music you know pictures <laughs> video <laughs> film uh, uh, imagine that world <laughs> thanks to everyone who listened and remember to be critically creative <laughs>